the shadows come Why should my heart feel lonely and long for heaven and home When Jesus is 
my portion. My constant friend is thee. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. Because I'm happy Yes, I sing Because I'm free For his eye is on the sparrow And I know he watches over me. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches. I know. He's watching over me, I know. He's watching over me. And I sing because I'm happy. For Lord, you know I sing because. And I know he's watching over me. His eye is on the sparrow. I know he's watching over me. He's watching
morning, wonderful people of God. I know members from District Number 2 and members from other churches here on the island of St. Croix in our region and around the world are locked in. So let me use this moment to wish you happy Sabbath and to bid you welcome. I also know that some of our amazing friends who are not members just yet are also locked in. We would like to let you know that you're in the right place if you would like to see God take you from where you are to where he wants you to be. So thank you for choosing to worship with us today. And I pray that you will be blessed by our ministry. If you're joining us for the first time, my name is Kadian Vo, and this is Messages of Hope, the virtual church for the Central and Hope Seventh-day Adventist churches here on the island of St. Croix, one of the territories in the North Caribbean Conference. Through the guidance of God, we are led by Pastor Thomas Rose, our senior pastor, and Pastor Timothy Leto, our intern pastor. On our program lineup for today, Pastor Rose will pray to acknowledge God's presence here with us and the work that God has been doing and will continue to do through this ministry. The praise team and our musicians are ready to prepare our hearts and lift our hearts heavenward by singing some of our favorite hymns. We will then jump into our lesson study, which will be focusing on part two of the lesson, Creation, Genesis as Foundation. It promised to be it promises to be eye-opening, so I encourage you to stay with us. Now, if you haven't gathered your family around your device just yet, or called someone to remind them to tune in, now is the time to do so. And please stay with us and see you after the lesson study. Let us bow our heads as we acknowledge God as our Lord and Savior. Let us pray. Wonderful, merciful Savior, what a privilege it is for us to worship you once more on this blessed Sabbath day. We thank you, Lord, that across the globe, from everywhere, individuals are at this time worshiping you. We thank you for having taken us through a week of toil and labor, and we thank you for the blessings of the Sabbath. As we worship you today, we pray that our worship will come up before you as sweet incense and that your name will be praised. As we go into a worship exercise today, Lord, may the glory of God come down, and may hearts be inspired and souls transformed to serve you as our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Bless our worship service now, we pray in Jesus' name. Immortal, invisible, God only wise. Join us in this familiar song. Immortal, invisible, God only wise. In the light, in the accessible, in the from our eyes. The most past and the most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. On the rest day, on the haste day, and the silent as the void, all wanting, no wasting, thy rule as his might. Thy justice like mountains, thy soaring above, thy clouds which are founded of goodness and love. To all thou thou givest, to all great and small, in all thy thou livest, the true life of more. We blossom and flourish as leaves on the trees, and wither and perish, but no 
change ever be. Great the Father of the glory of the Father, the might, thy nation's blood glory, availing that Son, all praise we would render, all have us this day, as only the splendor of light I dare to be. Amen, amen. One of our old Advent hymns, uh, number 382, O Day of Rest and Gladness. Amen. O Day of Rest and Gladness, O Day of Joy and Light, O Bob of Care and Sadness, most beautiful, most bright. O day the high and holy, who bears before the throne, sing holy, 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 to the eternal one. Thou art the more protected from storms and Yes, the 
holy Sabbath man, by a God we find it best, the list of us was from me, throughout all eternity. Good morning, saints of the living God. We want to wish you a very happy Sabbath. And to share with you the word of God this morning, always a joy to open the word. And today I feel especially proud to have with me two able persons, uh, two men who love the Lord and love his word. On my right is Brother Maitland Joseph, his Sabbath school teacher, and one who takes pleasure in discussing the word of God. And on my left is Elder Philip, Reynold Philip. Not only just a, a brother in the church, but an evangelist. A man who is known for his passion and for his gift as a preacher. We're looking at creation again this morning, part two, using Genesis as a foundation. And with limited time, we go straight to the memory text. It says, the heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament shows his handiwork. Very important. I'm going to ask that we look at a video to have an idea because for centuries, folks didn't quite understand what it means when we say the heavens declare the glory of God. Uh, there is a limited knowledge regarding what the universe looks like. Today with modern technology, new telescopes, the Hubble telescope, we have an idea because we can look beyond uh, earth now and see what it meant when it was said that the heavens declare the glory of God. Certainly men had to be inspired to know this for them to have said it. This is the earth in space. We have no idea and let me use the word observable. That's We're looking at some planets there. What is observable? Do you know that there are over two trillion at least two trillion galaxies out there. If we try to number the stars based on the scientific calculation, we're looking at one billion trillion stars in the universe when we say that the heavens declare, declare the glory of God. We can't think of what that number is like. Here's what the scientists are now telling us. All of the astronomers agree on this one thing. That if you take every grain of sand on the earth, every beach, go to Kramer's Park, Weston, all of St. Croix, all of St. Thomas, all of the islands of the sea, go to the Kalahari Desert, uh, go to all the, all the deserts in the world, all the rivers and all the seas, and you take all the grains of sand and you put them all together, there are more stars in the heavens than all the number of sand that we can find anywhere or totaling upon the earth. And so when we think of the glory of God, the heavens indeed do declare the glory of God. And the firmament, uh, beyond space, what we're looking at, really does show the, the glory of God. We're very happy that in years gone by, there are Christian scientists, men like Kepler, mentioned in our lesson, who uh, is known to be a great astronomer from Germany and mathematician. And he was best known for his work on laws of planetary motion, which today we can understand better because we know now how the moon influences the earth and agriculture and all these things. And Kepler was one of those who believed that God designed the earth with an intelligent, intelligent plan. Uh, we think of Isaac, Isaac Newton, uh, gravity. We think of Boyle, who was um, uh, known to be the father of chemistry. We think of another Christian scientist like John Ray, who just, uh, came up with the concept of species that one can only breed within a given species. So indeed, and in fact, 
the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament show it this handiwork. I don't know if any of my colleagues want to add anything to the thought of the memory text, any of you? Basically, when you look at the, the outer workings of God, you stand with your mouth wide open. All you can see is, wow. Wow. He's awesome. Yes, and uh, that's very true because when you, as we just saw on the screen, the, the magnificent and the creative power of God, that even when David himself um, think about God's creative work and he look and he says, when I think about the work of thy fingers and the, and the thing that you have made, what is man that you are that, that you are mindful of him? So indeed, um, God as creator is very awesome, and we just cannot understand God's creative power. The mighty God is he indeed, and what is man? And when we think of one trillion, one billion trillion planets out there in every every um, existing for a life, existing form of life out there. What is simple man? Our, our planet is really just like a grain of sand in the entire universe. Yeah, yeah. compared to, to what we see, it's a grain of sand. And that's why the Bible says, what is man? That what is man? Thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visited him. What a God. What a God. Now, let's turn to some of the early concepts um, that, that our forebears had about the earth. And, and we can see now where, where the Bible um, comes alive because what they thought in years gone by, we are now realizing to be the truth. So let's look at the concept Sunday on a flat earth. A flat earth. Is the earth flat? Is the earth flat? No, um, the earth isn't flat. The, um, um, the, earth, the earth is round. And going back centuries then, because the yeah, People who believe that the earth was flat and some believe that the earth was wrong, and so like Christopher Columbus, that um, he, they thought that the world was flat and some believe that the earth was round. And if you go too far west, that you would eventually tumble over. Um, but there are those who believe, no, the earth isn't round, the earth is flat and you wouldn't tumble over. Columbus was one of those guys who, um, who believed so and based upon his conviction concerning the earth, that he went to the, you know, the Queen of Spain, and he uh, talked with them, and as a result of that, they got through ship the Santa Maria, the Nina, and and um, and the Nina, and so he sailed the world. And indeed, that is what Columbus had one thing right, that you won't fall over. And the other guy, indeed, that the earl was round, but if you go too far away, you will not tumble over. Both of them have certain things in common, but was not right all the way. So indeed, the world isn't flat; the earth is round. But yeah. the Bible here speaks about the earth, um, the four corners of the earth. Right. Revelation chapter 7, um, verse 1, talk about the, the four angels um, holding back the, the four um, winds of strife or the four corners. And, and some people would make reference to that to, to suggest that the world is, is flat. But mm -hmm. basically, the context of this text here, if you were to go into verse 2, the angel says that um, do not hurt the earth until we have sealed the servant of our living God. So it's not talking as it really to the, the, the earth necessarily being um, flat, as they say, but it's pointing out the four geographical points of the earth, um, north, south, east, and west. Um, and so it's saying that the gospel is to be preached to all the world, in every corner of the world. And then God's people will be sealed, and the end will come. And That's actually, the reference to the text. Correct. And actually, it didn't say that that um, uh, gather my 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 uh, people from the from the four corners in terms of the the, ge the geography. It's really a figure of speech saying that gather all people wherever they are, north, south, east, and west. Everyone, right. because as you rightly said, Phil. The gospel has to be preached to, to every creature. And the people ask the question, um, when Christ comes, how is it that, that, that all of us are going to see him at the same time? Well, when Christ comes, we're going to see him at the same time. How is he going to make it possible that the person who is in the southern hemisphere see him at the same time as the people in the northern hemisphere? That's something for God. And you know, we are still looking at the universe not fully understanding. We I mean, all, this, all the figures the scientists are giving, they'll tell you observable, what they, what they can see now. 
before the Hubble telescope, they could only see the Milky Way, our galaxy. Now they're seeing into deep space. And who knows, with, with the development of, of technology, we're going to go deeper and deeper and deeper into the universe. But here's something. There was a, an, an image we were looking at a while ago that the Bible actually didn't say the earth is flat. The Bible said the earth has a circle. What did Isaiah say? I say Isaiah says the what? That God sits where? He sits on the circle. On the circle? The circle of the earth. On the circle. Yeah. So that it's, it's not a contradiction to, to speak of the earth, the four corners, not, not, not the flat earth, the four corners. And he speaks about God sitting where? On the... So it must be Isaiah must have been inspired because the scientists are now knowing that the earth is round. And Isaiah, way back there, spoke about the circle of the earth. But I like something better. I like Job. What did Job speak about when he spoke about the earth and its geography? Job speaks about what? And Job, and they're talking about Job um, 26, 7 to 10. And it says here, He stretches out the north over the empty place and hangs the earth upon nothing. He binds up the waters in his thick clouds and the cloud is not rent under them. He holds back the face of his throne and spreads his, spreads his cloud upon it. Let's, let's have a look at, at the, at the, at the, at the uh, picture of the earth in the universe. Because this is important to understand that Job says that the earth hangs on nothing. The earth hangs on nothing. Now, that's an image of the earth in space. I'm not seeing any, any strings or any ropes or anything holding it there. The, the, the power of God. And most of what we're seeing, there's water, and the water is not draining water. either. And so God awesome power again comes in display, or, or memory text says that the firmament shows his handiwork. His handiwork. His power is being displayed every day. And not, not only did God create and, and left it, but everything is being sustained by him. So, so that but Job, Job was not an astronomer. How he knew that? The Holy Spirit revealed that to him. It must have been that the Spirit of God told him the Spirit of God. Inspired. He's been inspired. God yes. showed it. That's right. Because I'm just about to listen that that um that God did not explain um um his creative power. He didn't he didn't leave, explain that to um explain that to man. Um, but the thing about when you think about God and to understand that this world is hung in space, um, um, nothing you see like Father say, nothing is is attached to it. Is that when you think about the awesome power of God, it just blows your mind. And then with um, God is so mighty, He's so powerful that the world cannot contain Him. But yet still, He's small enough to to um to live in our hearts. If we try to explain the power of God would lose our minds. But if we don't believe that there is a God and he do exist, we would lose our souls. So all we got to do is to believe and accept and put our trust in this awesome God that we serve. It's yeah. awesome indeed. I mean, when we look into the deeper realms of space, that earth we are looking at is really just like a grain of sand. That, that's why Isaiah says that, talking about God sitting in the circle of the earth, it also states that we, looking at we human beings, we are like grasshopper in, in his sight. Exactly. I, I think of all the scientific disciplines there, there are, that no group is m more agreed on their discipline than the astrophysicists, those who are looking at the deepest space. When all of them can agree that when you count every grain of sand on the face of the earth is less than the amount of stars in space. They all agree on that. Dr. Neil Tyson, one of the great black uh, astrophysicists. But when they all agree on this one fact, that there are more stars in space, and they're just beginning to see what's out there. They said, observable, what we can now see. Right. What an awesome God he is. That's right. Um, because um, when um, Apollo 14 went into orbit, and, and they listened to excerpt, and he said that, we cannot see the beauty of this earth. He said the earth is beautiful, but you have got to see the beauty of earth um, from outer space. And he said when they're going to orbit and what they saw, 
that is beyond human comprehension. And, and he, he's convinced that there's somebody greater than man to create the thing that they saw in orbit. And he convinced and admit that they have got to be a God. Amen. All right. Um, so it's really an awesome God. So indeed, and in fact, the psalmist is correct when he says that the heavens declare the glory, glory of, God, of God. And the firmament, which is out of space, shows his handiwork. Now, let's move on to the creation, the stories that are told. Um, you get into a discipline like cultural anthropology, and um, there are a few things that you find in every culture, a few, few things that are very common. One has to do with how the earth began, the creation. Another very common uh, belief is belief in God. They believe in a God, whether it be a stone, the wood, an animal, a mountain. Uh, they believe also most um, cultures, indigenous cultures, they also believe that there was a flood. These are common beliefs. Now let's look at some of the, the, the beliefs in terms of the creation because, um, as I said, every culture believes in the creation. They have a creation story. We have one that is mentioned here in our lesson study, the Atrahasis epic. Do, do, do you find anything, any holes in this story about creation? Well, the, the, the whole I see here is that it seems that man seems to be working so that their God can rest, according to the, according to the story. What, what is shown yeah. here. Man working so that their God can rest. Where we see, as opposed to creation in, in the Christian understanding and the Bible, is that God did his work and he, we rest with him. You know, so, so we enjoy in creation with God rather than we working so that our God can rest. All right. You want to add anything, Brother Maitland? Yes, because as we, as we looked in here, according to Astro he said, uh, a minor God is killed and his blood is mixed with clay to form seven males and females. But in Genesis, the first Adam is formed intimately by God who breathes life into him and woman is made later to be his helper. God didn't create Adam and Eve from the blood of a slain God. You know, one of the things that I find strange in all of the stories that I have um, looked at, Genesis stories, there is no explanation for the beginning. Right. Because even in this story, it speaks about the God and and. and and, 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 the, and the, the goddess and so forth. But the question is, where, where did they come from? That's right. I, the aborigines have a story that tells that, that, um, that the goddess took this baby up in a cradle in the sky and then dropped, dropped the, the cradle, and the cradle made a, a big crater in the earth, and so that's how their life began. Where did the baby come from? That's right. There is absolutely no explanation for a beginning and let me point out this, that the modern, modern evolutionists are now agreeing with us that there had to be a beginning That's right. in everything. Mm -hmm. but look, look, if you look at our, let's have a look at our Genesis story. Our Genesis story points out that when God called the earth into being, he didn't just call it into being without order. No. Without order. Man was made of what? On the sixth day? Sixth day. Yeah. But before yeah. man can survive, he needs water. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the first thing God did was to give light. Yeah. He needs water. Mm -hmm. He needs mm -hmm. light. Mm -hmm. he, he needs, needs food. Air, food. He needs air. So there's an order. He could not bring man before he had provision for man to eat mm -hmm. and to breathe. He didn't bring man to, to live in a dark world. That's why he had sun and moon. Which gave energy. So that in our, in our understanding of God, we can see not only a creator who brought things into being, but we see an order. There's an order. And so when God, when we understand that God made heaven and earth, we, we understand that indeed we are seeing a beginning God, in the beginning God. And that, that's very important. As you see, on the, the, the other um, religious um, uh, belief, they state that the baby come here and, and, 
and, and you know, certain things come. But the Bible starts, the first word in the Bible is, in the beginning, God created. So, so you know where it started. Yes. There is no question. And so the, the, the burden of proof, the burden of proof is not on, on God's word. The burden of proof is on those who are trying to deny mm -hmm. God's word. It, it is clear. It's there. When you look around, as we will see in some of the texts later, that we are without excuse. Just being on the earth, it tells you that there is a God and he's the one who sustains and keeps. And you are without excuse to deny that, it's saying. Exactly, because we see it, because these are all evolutionists and all of them, because the material they try to work with um, to disprove the power and awesomeness of God, who created them? So in any, in any and, and I don't know how one tried to be an atheist, but when you look upon the things and the earth and the things that are there in are, the heavens and the things that are there in are, how can one come to the conclusion that there is not a God and the thing that we see come by the, is that by the big bang arm, bang bang arm theory? It baffles my mind. Even, even with the, 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 the time factor, our neighbors, the Muslims who came from the same religious descent as we did, Abraham, children of Abraham, in, in, in the very creation story, some days for them, some days for them represent 50,000 years. In their teaching of creation, some days for them represent 50,000 years. But then, when I see man, when I read the other stories of God, uh, of our God, the, of their creation, and it's the goddess who gave this and the goddess who gave that, I see our God taking man and from man making woman, and in his own intricate way of doing things, he makes it possible. It, it takes a man, and it takes, I can't point in you, and it takes a woman to procreate. That's right. Procreate. As we say, it's not Adam and, it's not Adam Adam and Steve, Steve, it's Adam, Adam and, Eve. and Eve. And that's why the, the emphasis seems to be in, in Genesis that God created them male and female. I, I saw that repeated many times, the emphasis there, male and female. And one of the questions that can be asked is why male and female? Because we live in a society where people seem to believe about the alternate life mm -hmm. style. And, uh, but God is, is specific, male and female, for the purpose of procreation. The other story is some God who, who brought children in. Mm. But our God shows us by design it's a man and a woman who procreate. Right. And, and the intricate delicacy in, in this whole operation, where, 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 where David says that before he was conceived, <laughs> God knew every finger he had and every toe he had, every grain of hair. I mean, before man was made, God had already designed him. And he knows him. Um, so then the theory that man, that man was an afterthought, um, um, how does that fit? Because based upon what you said, and rightfully so, that man needs light, air, water, and food in order, in order to, su um, to survive. And God created all these things before he created man. So then this, this thought that man was an afterthought in God's plan, um, does that fit? It does not fit. Let me tell you why it does not fit. It does not fit because if there is a design, there has to be a designer. That's right. If you, if you have a design, when we design this church, Prudencia, when this church was designed, it was a gentleman who sat in his office and sat at his table and designed it. You cannot have a design without a designer. So the, the, the afterthought idea does not really stand. We see a God who, who, who said... God saying to God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, let us make man in our image. So God made man from the dust of the earth, and then he designed the woman. And then he said to them, go now and procreate. <laughs> Extend this great family of ours right. by design. And so on the idea of the afterthought, when you look at the fact that before God um, created man, God placed everything that we would need for sustenance 
For example, when people, you have babies expected in a family, you go and shop and buy certain things, the cradle, and, and you put things in place so that when that baby arrives, everything is in place. When you look at creation, God did the same thing. He, he placed everything there, the sunlight, the air, the garden, and then he said, now it's time to, to bring man about. Yes. So we were not an afterthought. We were taught off, and, and we thank God for yeah, that. Because when it comes to <clears throat> when it comes to God, there is no afterthought. Like I pass to say, God planned it. God worked by time. Um, with man, the afterthought is just like this week. Um, a guy brought to me to uh, to make a shield uh, for him out of leather. No, he 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 brought a sample of what that he wanted. But I was making it exactly um, the way he, he bought the sample. So then I called the guy and told him, well, the shield is ready. But then while he was there, I, it was an afterthought, and I said, no, it would be looking better if I put an edge around it and let it real, and it come out really, really nice. No, that was an afterthought. I, initially, I didn't have that, but when I look at it, I said, no, this would look very nice if I edit around. That was an afterthought. But with God, it wasn't so. That God have everything planned out exactly the exactly the way the way He worked it. And you know, it's really I would not even consider this to say an, an afterthought in terms of of the finished product because evolution, uh, you have what you call uh, uh, a, 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 the ch the the uh, the the growth and, and changes, and so that um, and that is where. Um, the, 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 some of the, the Christian scientists like, um, like, like John Ray comes in when, when he introduced the idea of species that um, there's evolution, the word really means change so there, there can, can be constant change but in terms of the creation the original creation of man there is a, a God who, who did it now we, we see here um, uh, gentlemen the, the idea of, of, of God speaking about the greater and the lesser light. The greater and the lesser light. And the lesson tells us that he did, God didn't have Genesis. Moses didn't use the word sun and moon. For what reason? What was the reason? Because other... Sun and moon, they used the term, it's an object of worship for them, most of them. Other cultures, correct. Other cultures, mm -hmm. are an object of worship for them. But the Bible make it clear in terms of the distinction and the purpose of each one of those heavenly beings. That's right. how, how do we do with them? <laughs> we, we, uh, we, uh, we are a little, it's a little warm for us in, in these parts now. But can you imagine living in the world, even with the warmth? Can you imagine being here without the sun? Well, we go back to the ice age. At least it helps us with COVID-19. It lessens our, our risk of being infected because okay. it's not heat resistant. So then when God gave, when God gave the sun and the moon, Genesis refers to it as the greater light and the less light, they all had a purpose. Yep. And the purpose, for example, what God said in Genesis. Times and time, and season. time, time and season. Um, night and they, yeah. So each one of them have their role. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, I have the formula that you have the, the earth around its axis, um, give you the 24 hour day, and then you have the, the, the moon, um, mm -hmm. the rotation of the moon versus the earth give you the month, mm -hmm. and then you have the, the sun um, uh, versus the earth, go the rotation again giving you one year. And so you have the, the, the complete, each one of them having their role. There. And it also helps us, even as farmers, to plant. Farmers they say, oh, four days, days before the full moon you plant, or four days after the yeah, full moon. The McDonald's alarm. Um, the McDonald's Because my Albanac. parents were farmers, and, and they used to go by the tea, by the McDonald's Albanac. We tell you, today is the day above, above ground sign, uh, tomorrow is the underground sign, and, 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 and they come out well. They come out well. Right. So, so we see that this thing didn't just happen, it's again by design. God um, directed, he have it that way and that's, but, but one other thing we look to mm -hmm. Pastor Michael, we see the, 
the, the, the 24 day come, we see the, the month come and also the year. Mm -hmm. And the question that, that came to me was, so where we get the weekly, the weekly cycle? Mm -hmm. The weekly cycle the week is one that seems to be mentioned here. Exactly. And, and one of the, one of the one, I mean, even the, the ocean, the waves of the sea, you have the low tide. Uh, those of you who have access to close enough to, to the North Shore, they, they, when it's a low tide, you can see St. Thomas as clear as day. What controls those tides? The moon. The moon. The moon. And that's what Genesis says for times and seasons. Amen. So God gave us the moon, even coming through the desert with, with Israel out of on, in the Exodus. So what do we see? God was leading them by cloud during the day and the moon by night. Right. And folks don't fully understand, except you, you go through the desert, what that means. Because desert is very hot um, in the day. In the night, it's extremely cold. So what we have in the night, what God gave Israel in the night, fire. Fire to, to warm Not only to up. lead the way, but to keep them warm. Amen. And in the day, he gave them the cloud to shield them from the heat of the sun. the sun. All right, let's, let's move on. We have a couple more minutes to finish up. Um, the creation and time. Creation and time. We have the history or the genealogy, as Moses wrote the genealogy from Genesis um, and then, of course, what it's pointing out here. And I like to say it's, it's from the first Adam. Th th this whole genealogy is from the first Adam to the second Adam. Mm -hmm. And it was done by oral history. Yeah, so, so you seem to be seeing that from, from the beginning in the Bible. It, it seems to be leading basically to the, the same bringing the sphere, the wrongness back mm -hmm. from Eden to Eden. Mm -hmm. um, for example, in Revelation, it makes reference to to the river, references made to tree the life. tree of life. So, so the Bible, in terms of time, is leading back to, to the origin. So it's from the first Adam, 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 Adam to the second, second Adam. Adam. To the second Adam. It's the first Eden to the second, to second. The second Eden. Yeah, because and it's all about time, because we creation and time, because you see from Adam to Enoch, and it talks about Adam, how long he lived before he had his first child, and then after that, then you go right down, go right down, go right down. And after that, then Adam, that, that, um, Adam died. So you see, everything with God concerning time, everything with God operate on a timetable. It's really, it's very important to, to understand that um, when, when Moses, when, when all this was taking place, there was no writing. Nobody knew anything about writing. In fact, writing only came about in 3,000 3000, 3001, 3004 before Christ. And so, and of course, Adam lived at least in a 3000, a 2000 year before that, that period of time. So it was all oral history, which some cultures still very, very much practice today, oral history. And this, so it's showing what, what I call the Salvitic history. It is leading us from, from the first Adam. And if you, if you look at Matthew chapter one, we also have the, the genealogy, genealogy right leading right back to to Adam. Mm -hmm. right so the importance of, of this history of time is not only the creation week, but it's also the time in terms of God sending the second Adam to save his people having erred and having sinned. That's right. And sometimes you wonder how, how they get these, these, these dates. Well, the Bible is, makes it so abundantly clear that if we can set up one historic date, let's say the reign of David or the reign of the son Solomon, um, we only have to go back to the begats to establish dates. And that's why we, we, we can rest assured that the, the, the earth as we know it is just about 6,000 years old, based on biblical history. So that when you look in the Bible and you're reading, for example, about the genealogy of the, the races, they are there for a purpose. They are there for a so purpose. So that, yeah, you could be pointed, you can go back and, and search and see where this person came from, what relation they have as it relates to the plan of salvation and with Jesus. Mm -hmm. Because our point is, is from Adam, the first Adam to the second Adam. Yes, and um, all, all, um, all, all people like my, my grandmother, you would tell me, okay, such and such, you related to such and such a person. And then when she started to, 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 to trace the bloodline, come is a whole line of generation that I'm completely lost. 
just to bring me back to the point that you are related to that individual? It's, it's a very important thing because um, when we can tie this together, we know for sure that our God has been leading. Um, and it's important to understand that God gave, this, gave these things to us for a purpose. Um, in African theology, there's a concept of when you die, you're not really dead yet. You continue, once you live in East African theology, once you, you live in the memory of the community, you're a living dead. You're a living dead. And um, when you leave the memory of the people, then you become a, a, a sort of a demigod. A demigod. So there's an there's a evolutionary growth from, from humanity to divinity, that sort of thing. But our God shows us that he being the second Adam, he came on time. As, as Paul wrote to the Galatians, in the fullness of time, oh, he, came. he came. So the genealogy that we're looking here is God showing us... Um, as Genesis 6 says, that, that, that the, the sons of God took his wife's daughters of men. And that's another debate altogether. Yeah. Who are the sons of God? Right. Yeah, those who take the position, they're angels. But how would angels have children with human beings? It makes no sense. In this sons genealogy, we see it's the sons of Seth. Sons of Seth. All right, let, let's, let's close off because we have another, very, to me, the nicest part of the whole lesson is, is Thursday, creation and scripture. What, what do you find here? Well, we find here, for example, first um, one being Matthew chapter 4, um, uh, chapter 19, verse 4 and 5. Reference again is made to the beginning. In the beginning, God made them male and female. That's the point here in Matthew chapter 19, um, verse 4 and 5. And, and many scripture, again, relating to the beginning. Yeah. Um, my thing here is to see how wonderfully that he. New Testament writers, how it fits right into the Genesis story and speaks so wonderfully about the Genesis story according to in, in Genesis 1. But my favorite, I go through all of them, but my favorite is way down in, um, in Revelation um, 3, 14, 2, 7, and 22, 2, and 3, where it talks about the tree of life. And here we saw Eden lost, Eden um, restored. Eden restored. And, and that's what we are longing for. To once again eat from the tree of life. And, and, and when I think of I just get, get goosebumps to understand that we're going to see it for ourselves and we're going to experience what it is when we eat from the tree of life. So Eden lost would be Eden restored. I, for me, in this particular passage, what, what arrested me is the fact that Jesus, who is God, Jesus who, without him, was nothing made that was made. That's right. Jesus who, John says, in the beginning was the word, the word was of God, and the word was God. The same Jesus who was in the beginning, the great God who created, he himself is referencing mm -hmm. the beginning. Mm -hmm. He was the one who referenced it. And then Paul, who actually met, Jesus met with Paul right. on the road to Damascus. Mm -hmm. And Paul, too, is referencing in the beginning. That's right. So that it's clear to me that if God himself, through Christ, who made of the earth and, and made man, could reference the beginning as authentic, then of a truth. There was a creation by God. That's right. Exactly. Amen. All right. We have to wrap up now. We have two minutes. And... Um, Gentlemen, uh, share with us your closing thoughts on, on this on this lesson. Set. Brother, Brother Maitland, you want to do it for us? Yes, my closing thought would be by Friday. Like Friday, as I read, the Bible is the most comprehensive and most instructive history which men, men possesses. It came fresh from the fountain of eternal truth, and a divine hand has preserved its purity through all its ages. Here only can we find a history of a race unsullied by human practice. I'll jump down to this last part. It says here, But when men leave the word of God in regard to the history of creation and seek to account for God's creative works upon natural 
principles, they are upon a boundless ocean of uncertainty. Just so God accomplished the work of creation in six days, he has never revealed to mortals. His creative works are just a comprehe as comprehensible as his existence. And I close by this mark because um, Sir Lionel Lacou, one of the greatest constitutional lawyers of the Caribbean, he, before he became a Christian, he said when he traveled... Go on. Go ahead. Go ahead. Time, sir. Okay. traveled to work on a case, he carried a great volume of book, but now he's a Christian, all he traveled with is one book, the Bible. Yeah. So, so, so my, my point is that, um, for example, we identify the, the, the monthly cycle, the yearly, um, and the daily. And then we did not mention about the, the weekly cycle. We talk about creation. What we discover that um, the, the Sabbath needs to come in play, even as we close, that the Sabbath identify the weekly cycle. Um, every six days, then Sabbath. Six days, Sabbath. Uh, Sabbath is like the icing of creation. And how often we human beings, we overlook uh, that very important fact. That's the only day in the Bible, in Genesis, um, that God says that he, he, he rested on that day and he blessed uh, the day and he sanctified, which we understand that term to mean to set aside. So why would we forget something that God set aside, even as we close, we can see that. Well, we thank God for, his, for the Bible. It tells us of the creation story, the history, and the fact of creation. Every time I go to the service station and pump gas, I'm reminded of the flood because we know the flood buried all the forests. And, and it's from there we're getting our oil. And, and we know that those of us who live in Trinidad, down in the Bray, the Pitch Lake, see ever so often chunks of tree roots coming up, um, which uh, were buried during the time of the flood, which authenticates the truth of the Bible. And so of, of, of a fact, we can believe the Bible because so often, and even now, science is showing through the, through the universe as we see the earth and space, uh, that the firmament shows his handiwork. We say praise be to God and we thank him for his goodness. Let us be faithful. Well, this morning, we surely got a solid, solid lesson in geography and history from a biblical standpoint. And we'd just like to thank Pastor Michael, Elder Philip, and Brother Joseph for explaining and discussing the lesson in such a plain and simple way for all of us to understand. Now, we have deviated from our regular program a few, for a few Sabbaths, and today we will continue with our regular programming by presenting our health nuggets. The praise team will sing for our divine hour. The stewardship corner will be featured, and we cannot forget our children's story. For the hour, for the speaker of the hour today is Pastor Timothy Leto, our intern pastor. And I know that God has blessed him with a word to share with us. So I pray that we will be blessed and that lives will be changed. Thank you for staying with us and joining us for today's worship. And I pray that you will truly be blessed. Remember to share our link and to call your friends. Tell them to tune in so that we all can enjoy the blessing of this ministry. Sabbath. Today, our presentation for our health segment is going to be on exercise. Over 20 benefits that you can get from exercise. One, you can get glowing, radiant skin. When you exercise, your pores open, and therefore your skin gets a good glow after you exercise. Another benefit, it can help to lower your blood pressure. It can help to um, boost your immune system. It can help with circulation. It can help with your heart. It can also help to make you flexible, help you be able to deal with stressors better, help you manage disease better. It can help to get rid of a cold. It can help to lower cholesterol. Now, some of the exercises that you can do can be as simple as walking, but you need to make sure you have the right equipment in order to walk. For example, these are not 
suitable for walking. You'd want to get a pair of sneakers, good fitting sneakers, along with some socks, especially if you're going to go for a very long walk. You need to put in at least 10,000 steps per day. Now, when you prepare to go for exercise, you need to also have water with you. Make sure that you do not get dehydrated. Dehydration can cause dizziness and fainting spell. Now, some other things that you can use to exercise is something as simple as a, a weight. This looks light, but it's actually about um, 20 ounces. Okay, so you can use it to exercise, help to build up your bicep as you exercise. Now, another thing you can do for exercise it's something as simple as a stress bar, a squeeze bar. Some people have problems making a tight fit. And the squeeze bar would actually help to increase the strength in that area. If you don't want to go walking and you do have the energy, you can do something as simple as jump rope. Jump in place, exercise in your house, go out on your porch and get some fresh air while you exercise. These are just pretend dumbbells, but weights also are good um, tools for exercising. It helps to burn the body fat. It helps to lower your blood sugar when you use your weight. You can also use something as a, a stretch band for your exercise, which means you're going to be using your own body strength against itself. You can use it to pull against the arm. You can help to strengthen up down low, you can put it underneath your feet and pull, and it will also help to strengthen your body. Now, you want to open up your chest. The lungs need a lot of air. When you exercise, that's one, another one of the benefits. Your body will get a lot of oxygen on the inside in order for the cells to be fortified with oxygen to do work for you. Now, exercise also helps to give you coordination and balance. It helps to tone the skin. It helps your brain to function better. It helps with weight loss and with keeping weight off. It helps to digest your food. You leave it enough. The nutrients will be absorbed in your body better if you exercise. Now, when you exercise, you can also help to manage your asthma. Okay. It helps with mood. It helps with self-esteem. It helps with burning calories. Now, it's all around a good thing. So remember, exercise is your first. Now, when you go out to exercise, you got to be careful with your mask. Make sure that your mask is a breathable mask made out of material. The N95 is not suitable for doing heavy exercises, so it makes it very difficult to do. Another thing with the mask, when you finish using it, Make sure not to touch the inside. Make sure not to throw the bands on the inside. Fold it in half and then tuck it away in a paper rag safely so that you can use it another time. Until you get home, you can put it in the sun, let it sun out, spray it in some antiviral spray. Now, remember that exercise is your friend. You want to use it so you can benefit all around. Thank you for listening. May God bless you and hope to see you exercising soon. Good morning again, and welcome to our praise and worship session. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb. Bring the best. 
Yes, only when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he can rescue me from danger, danger for his precious blood. Oh, to grace our rates of death, daily I'm most ready to be. Our tithes and offerings are to be viewed as a way to worship God, strengthen our love, and developing trust in God. Tithing manifests our faithfulness, and our offerings show our gratitude to God. 10% of earnings or income or increase should be returned for God. Bringing an offering should be the participation of every man. It is voluntary not by obligation or force, but delivered wholeheartedly with joy and gladness. The offering collected is for the Lord. We must recognize that everything we are and what we have belongs to God. Please encourage giving by the children. We have made a special envelope just so they have some fun, putting something in there every week to bring to, to the Lord. Bring your envelopes and your tithes and your offering as you were instructed. We want to thank you for your offering. We give the other Lord, whatever gift may be. All that we have is I alone, but trust the Lord for me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, please accept the tithes and offerings that we bring today as a token of our desire to serve and to worship you. Lord, help us to recognize your right over all that we are and all that we have. We thank you for your love and your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have you ever noticed that our lives are full of rituals? Think about it. Weddings, graduations, funerals, they all represent new stages or big changes in life. Likewise, baptism, family worship, or Sabbath public worship are crucial for spiritual growth. But is it right under normal circumstances to remain at home on Sabbath instead of going to church? 
According to the Bible, the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. This word in Hebrew is mikra, which means meetings or assemblies. It means that God expects us to meet with others, to have a weekly collective ritual on that day. We are also warned not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. As good as technological and online experiences may be, we are warned not to stay at home, but to seek for public, non-virtual worship. Whenever conditions permit, remember, the Sabbath is a holy convocation. Think about all the things we're able to do together on Sabbath. We pray, talking to God. We study His Word, hearing from Him. We sing, praising Him. And we bring our tithes and offerings, recognizing Him as our provider. Even though all the tithe and the main portion of the offerings may be given electronically, it is still very important that each family member learn to worship God by bringing offerings in a public service as an act of worship. As you return your tithe and give your promise, take a moment to pray and strengthen your soul along with your brothers and sisters. Reflect on the near future when you will be communing with Christ himself in the clouds of heaven. May we put our desires last and God first. you had joined me. Happy Sabbath to you all and welcome to Children's Story for Hope and Central Churches. Now I know you are wondering why do I have so many cans? Well I have so many cans because today's scripture reading is taken from Philippians 4 verse 13. I don't know if you can read that and it reads, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4 verse 13. So I have these cans to show you all the things that I can do. I can jump, I can hop, I can skip, I can sew, I can cook, I can garden, and I can use my hands to help my friends. Isn't that wonderful? Tell me about you. Tell me about the things that you can do. Put your thinking caps on and think for a moment. Hmm. What things can you do? Can you fly a kite? Can you ride a bike? Can you run really fast? Can you drive a car? <laughs> you probably can't drive a car. But that's okay, because in time, you will be able to do all the things that you need to do at a certain age. But how do you learn to do these things? Do you just think about it one day and do it? Or does someone have to help you? I know sometimes I find things difficult and I struggle. And I watch children and sometimes they struggle with things like their multiplication table or their spellings. And I want to say to you today that if there's anything that you are struggling with, anything that you are fearful of, take it to Jesus in prayer. Because when you pray, Jesus will give you the strength to overcome whatever obstacle is in your way. I want to share the story of David and Goliath. I'm sure you know it, but let's think about David and Goliath. David was a boy and Goliath was a big giant. David came to fight with just a sling and five stones. Goliath, the big giant, came to fight 
with a sword. Mm. Goliath thought he was superhuman. Nobody could slay him. No one was better than him. But David came with God on his side. And we all know what happened in the end. David slew the giants. So there's no one greater than God. And that's why God sent his son. And his son was Jesus Christ. And Jesus came to let you know that if you have any problems, you can pray to him. Now, children, I don't want you to be carrying all these cans like I'm carrying. And I know you've got lots of skills and I know you know lots of things. So instead of writing what you know on a can or the things that you can do on a can, I am going to send you an I can worksheet. And on that worksheet, you can write all the things that you can. In fact, you can turn over the sheet and carry on writing. And the things that you want to learn, the skills that you need to learn, you can also write them on the sheet. And when the time comes and you've learned them, you can put them in your can. Because you can. Let us pray. Because I want to invite Jesus here today. Bow your heads. Close your eyes. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much that you can give us the strength to overcome anything. And when we think of Goliath and David, we realize that you use even children to do your work. So, dear Father, I present these children before you. We ask you that they can be like David, that they can be strong, that they will rely on you and that they will come to you in prayer. Be with their parents and their families, Lord, who help them to learn. And we thank you in, and say all of these things. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, that's it for today, students and children and family members. We hope you enjoyed our story. And we look forward to another day of Children's Story with you. Take care. Almighty Father in heaven, we approach your throne of grace and your throne of mercy this morning. We know, oh Father, that we have all fallen short of your glory. But we know when we sin, there is much more grace available. So we bring ourselves before you this morning, O God, that you will be able, O God, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and create in us a right spirit that we can worship you, Lord, this morning in spirit and in truth. This morning, O God, we bring before you, O God, those who are home, those who cannot congregate here with us, but O God can see us, O God, via this, this media, O Lord, this morning. We pray, O oh God, that your blessings, O oh God, will be upon them, O oh God, this morning. You will touch them, O oh Father, with your spirit. You will speak to them through your word this morning. And we know that your word, which, of course, that brings salvation to men, O oh God. Those who have not yet known you as Lord and Savior this morning will come to know you as Lord and Savior. We pray, O oh God, this morning that your word will bring, O oh God, to men and women a change in heart. A different in spirit, O God, removing of God the heart of stone and imputing in us, O God, the heart of flesh, where we can able, O God, to stand in the days of, the, of, of your coming and the days, O God, when righteousness, O God, will fill this world with joy, peace, and a lasting happiness, O God, in our hearts. We pray, O God, that your word you said, which we, which we O God, will not return unto you void. But it will accomplish that which of course you have sent it to do this morning. We pray for the messenger of God this morning who will bring forth your word. Your word which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Will radiate through us, O God, and your messenger will bring this word this morning. Will, O God, bring to us the word of comfort, a word of hope, a word of joy, a word of happiness, O Father. Because all these merits comes from you. And we know, God, this morning, O oh Father, that you 
has chosen him, O oh God, Pastor Leto, to bring such a word of comfort unto us this morning. And we pray this morning, O oh God, that every soul, every individual listening to this word will be blessed. Will be moved by your spirit, O oh God. We come against every spirit, all false spirit, spirit of laziness, spirit of doubt, spirit of fear. Oh God, we come in your name, Lord Jesus, against all these false spirits. And we know, O oh Father, that they cannot prevail against your spirit of truth, O oh Father. Thank you for the blessings that we have received from day to day. And give us the strength, O oh Father, in these days that we are living as we face most of these things, this, this pandemic in this world. We know, O oh Father, that there are those who have lost their loved ones. We pray that you comfort them. Because in you there is comfort, in you there is hope, in you there is assurance, O oh God, this morning. So we plead our life into your hands. We plead the blood of God upon every soul this morning. Everyone who are here and those who can see, O oh God, from the, re, re, from the our voices, O oh Father. We know, O oh God, that they are here listening and you can be able to touch them, O oh Father, this morning. Thank you for the blessings again. And as we go out here by faith, may we stand in your presence, knowing, O oh God, that you have given us the spirit of, of truth and the spirit that able to walk through us. And we thank you for these blessings we ask all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. With my head bowed low in the darkness, as black as the day, and my heart held alone, and I cry, Oh, don't hide your face. So hold my hand all the way, every hour, every day, from me to the grave, on the take my hand, where we stand, where no one Like a king, I may live in a palace so tall with great riches to call my home, but I don't know a thing in this whole world that's worse than being alone. So hold my hand all the way, every hour. Every day, for me to the grave, I know the Take my hand, let me stand, when you want stand. Take my hand when no one 
so that I don't stand alone. Thank you so much, Brother Francis, for that lovely uh, ministry and music. The word of the Lord comes to us today from the book of Hosea, chapter 2, verses 14 unto 16. Hosea, chapter 2, verses 14 unto 16, and it reads, Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. And I will give her her vineyards from thence and the valley of Achor for a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth and as in the day when she came out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi and shalt no more call me Bali. With God's guidance and the Holy Spirit's direction and also your prayers, we'll spend some time speaking on a topic entitled, When Trouble Means Hope. When Trouble Means Hope. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, I pray that your spirit rain down. That Father, those who are watching and those who are within the sound of my voice, that they will experience something that they've never experienced before. I pray, Lord, that you will move me out of the way and that your spirit will take precedence. And that, Father, we will see you in the midst of these crises and we will see your face in the midst of this pandemic. Have your way in us this morning and we give ourselves unto you. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, this coronavirus pandemic has exposed many inherent things that would have remained hidden otherwise. From the onset of the pandemic, socioeconomic, psychosocial, and even spiritual problems have made their appearance in our lives. We've seen that we have had to live with less money coming in, and our anxieties have been heightened and our spiritual experience has even shifted. From a societal point of view, the inequalities of, of racism and racial bias have blown up in our faces yet again. As made evident by the, the, the murders of Ahmad Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and just recently, George Floyd. Hatred, bigotry, and ignorance have been made on display because of crises. And because these crises show us whom we really are. I don't know about you, but that makes me exclaim, Lord, this is troubling. In our spiritual experience, the same phenomenon has transpired. The reality of our condition lies before us. According to the Bonner Research Group, 48% of faithful churchgoers confess not attending even one online church service in the past four weeks in the U.S. alone. In other words, within the past four weeks, almost half of avid churchgoers can express that they have not been exposed to a service online. This inherently suggests that the value of our spiritual experience has dwindled, shifted, and for some, even disappeared. Because things aren't going well. Lord, this is troubling. This is the context of the book of Hosea. As the spiritual condition of the children of God is in deep trouble. Their vow and commitment to the covenant that God had made with them has fallen. The people of Israel, in, in a corporate sense, have turned their backs on a faithful God. The children of Israel have committed great whoredoms and harlotries as expressed by God by serving other gods and even sacrificing their children under King Ahaz like those heathen nations around them. The book of Hosea serves as a physical and tangible metaphor of the people's relationship with God and their infidelity. And the question I ask is, why would God go to this extreme length to to, to show the, the infidelity of the children of Israel. Well, uh, it means that God is also 
troubled by their spiritual relationship with him. Their, their spiritual condition was, was so depressing that God had to use unconventional means to get their attention. He asked Hosea, his prophet, to marry Gomer. Hosea, the prophet, was commanded to do the unthinkable in those times. Marry a prostitute. Scholars debate whether Goma was in fact a professional prostitute or if she simply had a, pro a proclivity to promiscuity. Nevertheless, it was something shameful to be aligned with someone in that condition. Not only was it shameful, but it was also painful dealing with both the stigma but also the infidelity. Hosea was a strong, obedient man of God, but this request still seems tough. You see, the interesting thing is that in the book of Levit Leviticus chapter 21, verse 7, uh, according to the ESV, it says, they shall, there's a direct quote saying, they shall not marry a prostitute or a woman who has been defiled. Neither shall they marry a woman divorced from her husband, for the priest is holy to his God. Leviticus 21, 14 says, a widow or a divorced woman or a woman who has been defiled or a prostitute, these shall ye not marry, but ye shall take as his wife a virgin of his own people. So God is using very unconventional means to get Israel's attention when asking Hosea to marry Gomer. In addition to this, God takes it a step further by naming the first daughter of their, of their union, Loruhama. Loruhama means God no longer has mercy. Depicting the judgment of Israel, God is literally saying that I will no longer have mercy on you anymore, Israel, because of your insolent and, and licentious behavior. The Bible says in Hosea chapter 1 verse 6, And she conceived and bare a daughter, and God said unto, unto him, Call her name Loruhama, for I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. Deuteronomy 4 verse 31 says, For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them. But here we see in, in God asking or demanding or, or commanding Hosea to name his daughter Loruhama, God is severing or, or God is seemingly severing the covenant that he had made with Israel because it was so serious. Another way of in, on, on conventional means God wanted to make his point, he asked or he demanded Hosea to name his other child Loami. Loami. Loami means, uh, in, in, in chapter 1, verse 9, Then said God, Call his name Loami, for ye are not my people, and I will not be your God. But this is in, 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 in conflict with Leviticus 26, verse 12, where, where God says, I will also walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. We see that there, there is some uh, a, a little differences here happening as to what God would have said before and what God is saying now in regards to Israel as a result of their insolence. You see, God is, is we have this particular concept of how God is supposed to react. We have this particular concept of, of God's character and we, we place him in a box. But by doing so, God is, is literally showing uh, the children of Israel and us today that sometimes you have to use unconventional means to get your point across. What am I saying? I'm saying that the spiritual condition of the children of Israel was so dire and so depressing and, 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 and so uh, deeply rooted in licentious practices that God had to, to use means by which we would shun for him to get their attention. These are troubling times because God's people need God to do something that seems unlike his character for them to wake up to their spiritual depravity. It's a very dangerous thing when we need God to scream or to shout or to physically manifest 
uh, our issues so that we be able to understand that we need him more. He even moved further by, by, by starts seeming to tear down a lot of the things that the Israelites had in their hearts and a lot of the practices that he had set up with them from beforehand. In, verse one, in, in chapter 1, verse 11, he says, I will also cause all mirth to cease, her feast days, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and all her solemn feasts, all those things, I will cause those things to cease. God is moving at a point where he is so frustrated, he is so angry that the Sabbaths and, and the new moons and their, their festivals and all this religiosity and those religious practices have no credence for him because their spiritual relationship, their heart connection with him is one where he would say they have no connection with him at all. And so God was saying that he will cause all these things to cease. Put those things aside and focus on your connection with me. You see, God was going to, uh, to a length to be able to demonstrate to Israel that he was serious. See, oftentimes we, we look at God or even Christ. We look at God or Christ as, 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 as uh, entities who are just docile and even aloof or haughty. Uh, but, but God is directly interested in the affairs of his children and in the affairs of men. And we see that he will go to, to any point to be able to cause us to be brought to repentance and to look at him and to realize that we absolutely need him. Our passage of consideration is so beautiful because after God says, I will cause all these things to cease, and, and basically, I, I, I will visit her, uh, I will visit upon her the days of Balaam, wherein she burnt incest to them. And I, God had pronounced judgment. But I'm thankful that there is a verse 14 of this chapter. You see, I, you know, we could have been doing things from before. Our experiences and all these sinful things could have happened before, but I'm I'm grateful that there is still a, a verse 14 of our experience where God could, could come in and, and, and show and, and do something different on our behalf. Verse 14 says, Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. The word therefore here, as we translate it in English, in Hebrew, is actually nevertheless. It says, nevertheless, uh, all those things would have happened. Israel sinned. Israel, Israel, uh, uh, they, they, they practiced licentiousness. They had no cares for their neighbors. They, they, they disregarded God in every single practice that they did. Nevertheless, nevertheless, behold, I will still allure her. Now that, that's supposed to make some of y'all say hallelujah. And that's supposed to make me say hallelujah. Because that, that shows that despite my, my situation, despite the things that I would have done in the past, despite even going away from God, he can still, nevertheless, he can still see a, a something within me that is work working. He can still shower me with his grace. He can still shower you with his grace. He can still shower you with his mercy. Nevertheless, I, I'm so glad there's still a nevertheless. You know, some of us may write off our stories and say, God is, is I'm, I'm too far for God to touch me. I'm too far gone for God to even uh, regard me. But, but I'm here to let you know that there's a nevertheless to your story. Nevertheless, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness. Now, when I read this section here about the wilderness, I was a little confused. God is saying, I will bring her. Uh, the, 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 well, referring to Israel as his, as his bride, as his wife. I will bring her into the wilderness. I will bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. 
Now, the wilderness is not a place where I would associate comfort with. How can you associate comfort with a wilderness experience? How could God speak comfortably to anyone or to me in the midst of a wilderness experience? You see, the wilderness is where there is no known source of water. There is no source of distraction. There is no source of... Uh, you're moved away from the things that you hold dear and comfort comfortable to you. But God is saying, I'm going to use the wilderness so that I may be able to speak comfortably unto you. That says that God sometimes has to take, a, take us away out of our comfort zones so that we be able to experience him in a new way. God sometimes has to move us out of the place of our comfort so that we can hear his voice. I don't know about you, but, but uh, this pandemic has, has unearthed many things. We spoke about racial bias. We spoke about all those things. But it also unearthed that I need the Savior even more day to day. I will speak comfortably unto her. You will be able to see my face, he says to Israel, in the midst of your wilderness. I just want to say here today that you may be having a wilderness experience right now. You may be going through the struggle. You may be going through a path where you feel like there's no hope. You may be going through a situation where it feels like it's too much for you. But God is saying that he can meet you in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. God is in your wilderness. and He's there to speak comfortably to you. And he says, I will give her her vineyards from thence. From the wilderness. From the wilderness, God is able to give us vineyards. Uh, he, he, can, he, can give you, uh, he can give you sustenance in the midst of emptiness. Man. He, he can give you back, and, 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 and this is making direct reference to, to, to earlier in, in, in chapter 1. Where God was saying that I will take away her corn and her vineyards and all her sustenance. But here he says, I will be able to give her her vineyards in the midst of the wilderness. Uh, that may sound crazy for some of you, but that's the type of God that we serve. When, when they were, you're in the middle of a wilderness experience, once you are with God, he can make that wilderness experience to, to, to be a sustenance like bountiful waters for you. He can make that wilderness experience to be the best experience of your life. You could be in a situation of emptiness. You could be in a situation of drought. You could be in a situation of worry, anxiety, and care. But God is still able, if you ask him, if you beg for him, if you plead for him to come into your situation, when he enters in, he promised that he will give you vineyards in the midst of your wilderness. Yeah. I need you to know that God restores. We would have seen so many things happen in the world today. So many things are going on. People have lost loved ones and, and we see racial things going on. I, I have to say that again because it's so, it's so distressing to, to see a man die in, in such an ignominious way. Uh, we see all these things going on in the world, but God is still saying, if you look at me, if you focus on me, if, if you nurture your relationship with me, if you look to me, all these things, I can, I can somehow, I can somehow restore them in your life. I can somehow grant you sustenance in the midst of your emptiness. He will restore the things that she gave up. He will restore the things that we gave up. He will give you back the things that were taken. Is there anybody that feels that God has taken something away from them? I'm being real here with you today. Is there any time when you would have prayed and fasted and cried and begged God to do something for you and you feel like you have not been able to receive it? He points to the day. He says, one of these days, I'm going to give that back to you. I'm going to restore. 
And then he continues to say something just so marvelous. He says, I will give her a vineyard from this and the valley of Achor, Achor, for a door of hope. Now, the valley, the valley of Achor, it's not just a regular valley. I, you know, while I was reading, I was just, what's up with this valley? What's, 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 what's this with this valley? The valley of Achor is situated northwest of Jericho on the northern side of the tribe of Judah. And this is the place where the Israelites executed Achan and his household. Achor means trouble, affliction, or taboo. And it implies a severe kind of trouble. Somebody listen to me, to me today. When, when you look in, in the book of Joshua, you realize that Achan had sinned against God. They were in a battle of, of Jericho and, and God had told them, commanded them to not touch anything. Because that was supposed to be his city. The spoils was for him. God had ordered all the spoils to be consecrated unto the Lord in Joshua 6. But Achan, Achan chose to go against what God had said and take some of the spoil for himself. And next, Israel had to fight against Ai, a much weaker city than Jericho. But the battle ended in humiliation. And the Lord revealed to Joshua that his anger was provoked because of Achan's disobedience. Achan was deemed the troubler of Israel. He brought trouble unto the entire nation. God said, Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. They have put them with their own possession. Israel stood guilty before God because of the sins of one man. Only one person had acted in disobedience, but all Israel was held responsible. See, God saw them as one people. And Achan's sin was so profound in, 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 in the community that, that uh, you would refer to Achan, Achan's crime as one of the worst things to happen to, to, to the Israelite nation. It was the first act of disobedience recorded once they crossed over into Jordan. Mm -hmm. And his death was divinely commanded in the new land. God made it clear that corruption in his family is damaging and disastrous. Mm -hmm. And Achan and his entire family was stoned and burned in the valley of Achor. So when God says, I am going to use, I'm going to make the valley of Achor a door of hope, what, 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 is, what, is, what is God saying here? God is saying, I'm, I'm glad you asked, God is demonstrating that he's able to use a point of your deepest downfall as a door for your deliverance. Mm -hmm. You see, sometimes we may feel as if, like I said earlier, we may feel as if God has turned his back he, 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 he can't do anything for us. But I am reminded of the fact that my God is powerful. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty that there's nothing that my God cannot do for you. If my God would have created the world and, and six days and rested on the seventh, if my God would have created the planets and, and the stars and set the earth in motion, if my God is able to call water from a rock, why would you think that God is not able to save you in the deepest points of your despair? Why would you think that you are too far from God for him to be able to touch you and to save you and pick you up? I am a living testimony of the fact that God can use the deepest and, and, and the, the, the hardest trauma and sin in your life 
for his glory. Romans 8, 28 says, for I'm reminded that all things work together for good for them who are called according to his purpose. I needed to understand today that despite the fact that some things may not be good, despite the fact that your experience on earth may not be the best, despite the fact that your, your behavior or, or, or your, your, your sinful proclivity may cause you not to be the best, my God can still come into your situation and use that point and use that point for your deliverance. What a God. My God could orchestrate a wilderness experience to save you. Mm-hmm. My God could, could orchestrate a wilderness experience for, for your reconnection to him. My, my God can use, use the nastiest things in your life. He could use the nastiest things of your life. For your redemption. Uh huh. And the same thing, the same things, huh, the same things that people would have looked at you for and said that you were nothing and would have discarded you and thrown you out and treated you all kind of different ways and looked at you if you were less than. God is going to use that for a door of hope. Mm hmm. It says, I'm going to use the door of the, the A, A chord, the value of A chord for a door of hope. He says, she shall sing there, just like in the days of her youth. And as in the days when she came out of the land of Egypt for deliverance. And it shall be on that day, said the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi, and shalt call me no more Bali. This is making reference, Ishi. Ishi is the term for husband. It's the most endearing term that you could use to describe your husband. You see, he says that you will not call me Bali because uh, Bali means master. And it was closely connected to the, to the bales and the, the Baalim that they were serving. But, but God was wanting to just reorient their experience so that they would no longer see him as just their master. But they will see him as their husband, his, their friend, their savior, their lover. You know, sometimes we look at God as if he is one who, who sits high and he, 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 he wants to beat us and he wants to destroy us. But God is saying today, I don't want you just to see me as your, ma your master. I want you to see me as your husband. I want you to see me as your lover. I want you to see me as your savior. Someone needs to change their perception of God today. You might have been going through the pandemic and you can't see and understand why God is the way he is. Or you're, you're having a hard time to understand how God moves. But God is wanting to show you today that, that you don't have to see me as, as just your master. You don't have to see me as, as just a, a, an aloof and haughty God. I want to have a relationship with you. I want to have a relationship with you. It is true the wilderness experience. Where the children of Israel is alert and uh, the children of Israel are alert into the wilderness and spoken comfortably by God. It is through the valley of Achor being used as a door of hope. It, it is through those experiences that God has, uh, has planned to strengthen his relationship with his children. Sometimes we don't want to go through the toughest experience of life. Sometimes we don't want to experience the bad things. Sometimes we have a hard time understanding why God would permit and allow things to happen in our lives and in this world. But God is saying that those things are allowing, those things are being allowed because he wants you to, to uh, uh, turn to him so that your relationship will be brought closer to him. The truth is, uh, some of us wouldn't be praying as hard if we didn't have a little trouble in our lives. Some of us wouldn't be worshiping as hard if we didn't have that cancer. Come on. Some of us wouldn't be in a position where we would have prayed and fasted for God if things were going right. And so I'm so grateful that God could use. God can still use. 
all my experiences to bring forth restoration and redemption. Friends, the things that we see going on around this world hurt. And the experience that you're having may not be the best on this earth. We're having a hard time economically. Our minds are messed up. Our lives of other sorts. And the institutions that we would have trusted are in turmoil. But there's one whom we could still trust. There is one in whom we could still place our trust. And that is Jesus. Today, he wants to be your friend. He wants to be your savior. Will you let him in? Shall we pray? Father, what an awesome and magnificent God you are. Despite what we go through, despite the things we see on this earth, and despite our own sinful proclivity, you can still bring forth restoration and redemption once we give our lives to you. We're so grateful, God, that the things of our lives and the things of this experience do not push you away. As a matter of fact, you're attracted to that. Because you want to come in and work a new work in our lives. And so, Lord, help us to surrender to you. Knowing, Lord, that you are the one that we can trust. Father, we look forward to the day when you will make all things new. We look forward to the day when this restoration will not only happen in our hearts, but in every single thing around us. And we look forward to the day, Lord, when we will be able to sit with you for eternity. Where we will be able to be in bliss. And death and sighing and racial bias and corruption will be no more. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 We're so thankful today for the reminder that the length in which God will go to save us is not limited to unconventional or conventional means. Amen? Amen. So be continue to trust God. Continue to trust God because with him, there will always be a nevertheless moment in your story. I pray that you will continue to Trust him and be faithful. As we come to an end, I want to encourage you to join us tomorrow on Sunday for our Sunday evening service. And that you will enjoy the remainder of our Sabbath hours. Be blessed.